Now, we all know what a compiler does. It takes your high-level code and compiles it down to something that your computer can execute. In fact, if you watched my ISA video from some time back, you realize that it doesn't just do that directly, it goes through an intermediate assembly code state. That is where some interesting things can happen, and in fact, that is what some compilers do. They actually optimize your code. They don't just convert it verbatim, but they actually do some things to make your code run faster. Today, all we're gonna do is we're gonna just scrape the tip of the iceberg, and we will take a look at some means in which a compiler can make your code run faster. You're watching another random Wednesday episode on 0612 TV. Hello and welcome back to another random Wednesday episode. Today, we're just gonna look at eight simple things that your compiler can do to make your code run faster. What this means is this list is not exhaustive at all. In fact, if you look you know, towards Wikipedia for more information on this, you'll realize that there are a whole load of different ways in which your compiler can achieve this. Some of these can be very complex, some of these require, you know, pretty deep understanding of how computers work. So we'll not go into those. We'll just talk about the simplest ways, you know, those that are easiest to intuitively understand. And if you'd like to find out more, well, Wikipedia has a whole wealth of information. And of course, you can use the references on all the pages to look beyond that. Anyway, let's begin. Here are eight different ways in which your compiler can optimize your code. First is removing redundant code. If you ever, you know, write code that says, do something, but this doesn't actually give you any discernible result, then that statement doesn't have to be run at all. For example, if I would assign a variable and then never use that variable again in my program, then I shouldn't have wasted the time to assign that variable in the first place. So that statement can be taken out and your program will be slightly faster since it doesn't need to do that. Other examples of this include, say, if else statements where the condition is always true or always false, meaning you don't have to check the condition at all because one half of that code is never going to run. Other examples will be functions that don't do anything. If that is the case, then don't run that function. Number two, you can actually compact instructions. This is easier to see with an example. So let's say I have an instruction that says x equals x plus one. What your computer is going to do is it's going to take the value of x, add one to it, and then assign it back to wherever x is stored. So this is in essence two different steps, an addition step and a storage step. Instead, what you can tell your computer is to just increment x. That way, it can actually do the operation in place. Even if you think of this in terms of lower level assembly code, writing things this way is faster as well. So yeah, an instruction like this can be compacted. Number three is to choose faster or more efficient instructions. This one is very machine dependent, but in general, different instructions were not created equally. Some instructions can execute really quickly, whereas some other instructions may require a few clock cycles. One of the top examples of this is if you want to say x times 2. In general, multiplication on a computer may be a complex operation, but when you're multiplying things by a factor of 2 or 4 or 8, you know, any power of 2, you actually have an easy way out, and that is to simply bit shift. Multiplying a number by 2 is simply doing a bit shift to the left, and that is just one operation, which is faster. Similarly, a division by a power of 2 is simply a bit shift to the right. With this understanding, certain calculations can be performed faster. Number 4. Removing redundant computation. And I know we've talked about redundancy before, but in this case, this would be in the form of math. For example, if we say x times y, plus x times y, if we were to you know, process this in its entirety, then we're doing the same calculation twice. Instead, you could just do the calculation once and remember the answer, and then use it twice in the subsequent calculation. That way, you only do two calculations instead of three. Here is a slightly more complex example. 
Notice the variable b is doubled up in addition to the constant term. We can simplify this expression and as a result, we end up doing slightly less work. So these are some basic optimization techniques. But if we want to take a step back and look at slightly wider amounts of code, then even more can be done. In particular, a lot of interesting things can be done to whole loops to make them more efficient. The first and the simplest thing to do is to unroll a loop. That is to get rid of a loop entirely and just copy and paste its contents as many times as was required. You see, when you actually run the loop as it is, basically the instructions will look something like this. You execute a bunch of code and then you check to see if a condition is true. If it is true, jump back to the top of the loop and run it again. And of course, you can see how this works like a loop. It keeps going back until a condition is met, then it jumps out of the loop. You see, the problem with jumps is they tend to be inefficient. On a computer, instructions are actually passed through a pipeline. That is, an instruction isn't executed at once. It needs to go through several stages of processing, and this is what we call a pipeline. To make things faster, we actually put subsequent instructions into the pipeline even before the first instruction finishes. As you can see, the second instruction enters the pipeline when the first instruction is only in the second stage of processing. This would of course be faster than having one instruction go through the entire pipeline before letting the next instruction enter. But the problem is this, what if this first instruction in green is a jump instruction? What that means is the subsequent instruction isn't going to be run at all. There is no way for us to find out it is a jump instruction until too late. And what this means is we have to flush out the pipeline. We have to get rid of the next instruction that turns out is not going to be run at all. So what we end up with is an empty pipeline that we have to repopulate from scratch. And what this means is things have slowed down because of a jump. We want to avoid that as much as possible. By unraveling a loop, even if you don't do it completely, what you're doing is you are reducing the number of times you need to jump. And as a result, things get faster. Unrolling a loop also gets rid of some overhead associated with loops. Examples of these include having to check the condition to see if a loop should terminate, or the arithmetic associated with incrementing the loop parameter. You don't even have to unravel a loop completely. For example, if you have something that loops 100 times, if you duplicate the statement just 5 times over, you've reduced the number of iterations down to 20, and you've actually gotten rid of 80 of those jumps. So that is a huge improvement in and of itself, despite the fact that you didn't get rid of the entire loop. Number six, a very simple optimization where you look in a loop and you look for something that doesn't change. These things are called loop invariants. And since, well, you are repeatedly calling the same statement in a redundant manner, why not move it out of the loop and have it execute just once before the loop begins? That, of course, saves you some time as well. Number seven, being aware of multiple processors. Of course, most computers today are multi-core, but traditionally, you need to be aware of the fact that there are multiple cores. You need to write your code in a manner that uses them before you can benefit from this. Thanks to compiler optimization, that is no longer the case. There are many ways that an optimizing compiler can achieve this. For example, if you have a loop that goes from one to 10, Maybe iteration 1 to 4 is run on one processor, then 5 to 7 is run on another one, and 8 to 10 is run on another one. That way, of course, you can finish your loop faster because different iterations are being run at the same time. Alternatively, you can simply say iteration 1 runs on processor 1, iteration 2 runs on processor 2, and so on. And when those finish, you give all the processors the next iteration, whatever it is. Number eight, this one is interesting. You actually can remove a redundant if statement inside a loop. Let's say what you have is a loop and inside that loop is a giant if statement, which depends on a condition that doesn't change during the running of the loop. Since that is the case, we can actually move the if statement outside and actually put two loops inside the if else statement. The optimization we've achieved from doing this is we don't actually have to check the condition every iteration of the loop. 
Of course, we need to know beforehand that this condition doesn't change, and if it in fact doesn't, then we really only need to check it once, and then just loop through whatever you need to loop through, without having to recheck the condition. And there you have it. These are the 8 simplest optimizations an optimizing compiler can do. As I mentioned earlier, this is just the tip of the iceberg. These optimizations are some of the most glaringly obvious ones that I can find. But really, writing a compiler is a science. It is a very complex task in and of itself, and it's made even worse if you want to optimize the code while compiling it. As mentioned, look to other resources if you're interested to find out more on this subject. But that's all there is for this video. I hope you gained some insight today. Thank you very much for watching, and until next time, you're watching 0612 TV. Thank you very much for watching. If you liked this video, consider checking out the rest of my work on my channel. Alternatively, you may be interested in a playlist of my earlier work on computing and computer science topics. If you'd like to show me some monetary support, I am on Patreon. You can find a link to my campaign in the video description. Of course, you can simply like this video or leave a comment. I'll be sure to respond as soon as I can. To keep in touch with my future uploads, do subscribe to this channel. And for even more updates, check out the official Twitter account for this channel at 0612TV. Thank you for your support.